it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Hoarding refers to the excessive acquisition and persistent difficulty in discarding or parting with possessions, regardless of their actual value. While it's natural for individuals to accumulate belongings over time, hoarding becomes a problem when it reaches extreme levels and starts interfering with daily life. There are a number of dangers associated with hoarding. Cluttered rooms with excessive amounts of flammable materials such as papers, fabrics or chemicals are at a higher risk of fire. Blocked exits, overcrowded spaces, and malfunctioning electrical systems due to hoarding can further exacerbate the fire hazard. The excessive weight of hoarded items can strain the structural integrity of a building, causing damage to floors, walls, ceilings, and other parts of the building. Over time, this can lead to structural instability, making the living space unsafe. Hoarded materials can accumulate dust, mold, and other allergens, leading to poor air quality. Breathing in these pollutants over an extended period can cause or exacerbate respiratory problems and allergies. And of course, hoarding can lead to unsanitary living conditions, making it difficult to clean, organize, or maintain a safe environment. Accumulated items can create fire hazards, increase the risk of falls and injuries, and impede emergency exits. Piles of belongings may also attract pests, such as rodents and insects which can pose health risks. And then, of course, there are hidden dangers that we never even think of, as we'll see in tonight's story. The Spores by Mammoth Weight 3544 I brought the truck to a stop and surveyed the property. A terraced house in an unsurprisingly poor state of repair. Green moss buried the roof, and damp leaf mold overflowed from the gutters. The flaking exterior brickwork was the same pallid grey as the overcast November sky. Litter speckled the cracked masonry of the front yard. The desolate, dilapidated view echoed the hundreds that had collected in my memory over the course of my time on the job. I'd generally only see a building I'd been assigned to in its most degraded, uninhabitable state. Let me smoke a cig before we get started, Henry, my partner and old friend, said. He wiped the grease of a McDonald's breakfast on his overalls. This is going to be a long one. Drugs, Dan? I asked. Nah, order. I see you don't bother reading the notes anymore. Well, skimming is a type of reading. We got out of the truck. Henry smoked a cigarette while I checked my phone. My girlfriend, Melinda, had messaged to ask if I could cook a pasta bake that night. I replied that I wasn't sure yet, and wasn't sure what time I'd finished work. I'd cleared out a number of dwellings occupied, or recently occupied, by compulsive hoarders in the past. Surprises were to be expected. I was almost looking forward to seeing what was in there, though my back and elbows already twinged in anticipation. How's Connor getting on at school now? I asked. Uh, Still struggling, Henry said. He's not an academic like Kerry is. Well, that's boys for you. I don't know. I think it's more than that. I mean, he really tries. Not like me in school. I just didn't care. He actually wants to do well. Me and Jill are taking him to see if there's anything to diagnose him with. And there might be help and support he can get. He's just not really happy as he is. And the school haven't got the resources to give him extra help for now. It's upsetting. Well, if he ever needs cheering up, I'll take him for a kick around on the field or to the arcade. His old uncle's always here for him. Look, I'm serious, any time. It's the closest I'll come to having any myself. Once Henry had flicked the nub of his cigarette away, we entered the house. As soon as we crossed the threshold... The air congealed into the stale, choking thickness that I associated with places like this. The chaotic fragrances of a lifetime of assorted junk, decomposing in the claustrophobic space into which it had been jammed, wafted over my nose in waves. The front hallway floor was barely visible beneath leaning stacks of shoes, newspapers, 
Boxes, waterproof coats, lampshades, fishing equipment, and various other nonsense that the former occupant had collected. Damp mottled the sparse patches of wall that were visible. Dust and cobwebs clung almost ubiquitously to the clutter. Henry and I both donned face masks and work gloves as we proceeded into the depths of the house. The place said, leptospirosis, written all over it. I felt the same poignant ache for this anonymous person as I had for several other similar hoarders whose homes I'd voided. No matter how many hours I spent working in such conditions, I simply couldn't imagine living in them. Whomever had hoarded all this must have existed almost entirely within the tiny gaps that wound between the precarious slopes of rubbish through which Henry and I awkwardly maneuvered as we inspected the house. As we explored the rest of the property, I reached the conclusion that we wouldn't be able to complete the work that day. The living room was dedicated mostly to electronics and ornaments, with a couple of guitars and shelves worth of DVDs thrown in. The kitchen table and work surfaces groaned beneath the weight of takeout packaging, and I could all but taste the grease and salt on the air. The upstairs bedroom and bathroom appeared barely usable, submerged as they were under the clothes of every style and size imaginable, as well as toys, ornaments, magazines, photo albums, camping gear, and more that we couldn't identify. The back garden was, mercifully, not on our list of things to sort out. An entire skip would be filled just with the gigantic tangle of weeds by which it was inhabited. That would be a problem for a different contractor. I climbed back into the truck and deposited the first skip onto the front yard, as close to the front door as was possible. We'll be here again tomorrow by the looks, I said, as we began carrying items from the front hallway out to the skip. Whoever lived here has passed away, right, Henry? Well, um... About that, Henry said as he deposited a child's tricycle into the skip. I heard he, um, disappeared, vanished from the system. I was talking to Rob from the council last night. He said some fella had been living here since he was a kid. Inherited it from his mother. Barely ever left the house and stopped leaving entirely the last few years, what with online shopping and what have you. And one day there wasn't enough money in the account that was paying the council tax or whatever. Benefits had been frozen for one reason or another, then payments carried on going out until there was nothing left. Someone got sent round here to serve some papers and got no reply. Eventually, someone let themselves in, looked round as best they could, realised there was no one home. No reply to emails, phone calls, nothing. No hide nor hair of him. Unless he's buried somewhere in all that, of course. Well, I'll eat my own fingers if anyone actually checked. Well, properly off for more than five minutes. So, basically, no one would even know how long he's missing for. Yeah, pretty much. Ah, sounds about right. Not so much as a welfare check for years by the looks. Well, chat was a hermit and a hoarder. There weren't any signs to pick up on. No family or colleagues or anything. I'm glad he wasn't an animal lover on top of that. Yeah, for real. A horde of cats would have topped this place right off and made it a hall of famer. We worked for close to seven hours, with a break halfway through to eat some sandwiches and smoke a cigarette. We used hammers and screwdrivers to disassemble wardrobes, tables and other furniture. Two of the skips were piled as high as they could safely be. Henry had found a couple of video games and a plastic harmonica that he planned on giving to his children and I'd picked up a dusty but unopened bottle of wine that I thought Melinda might appreciate. It was far from the worst place I'd ever emptied, given how little organic waste was in the property. I've been to places with decomposing animal carcasses on more than one occasion, but this occupant had seemingly lived off takeaways and hadn't even had anything in the fridge at the time the electricity was shut off. Well, that'll do for today, I said. Are you taking these to the dump? Henry asked gesturing at the two full skips. Nah, we can sort that out tomorrow, first thing. Oh, my back's killing me right now. I'd appreciate more heads up on jobs like this. Oh, Rob did specify severe hoarder. Remember when we talked to him on the phone the other day? Yeah, you were there. He reckoned to be a two-day a minimum. 
Well, that's what I pay you for, isn't it? Paying attention to Rob isn't my thing. Driving the truck is my thing. Paperwork and phone calls are all Henry things. That's official. I locked the door. Then we climbed lethargically back into the truck and drove away through the gathering gloom of the evening. Henry pulled an energy drink out of his bag and drank it as we went home. Going swimming with the kids again, are you? I asked. I'll see if they want to do that, Henry said. Or play Monopoly or something. I just know I won't be relaxing for a few hours yet. Well, it's tough all round. I've got to cook a pasta bake as soon as I get back. It's a lot of work. Oh, how do you cope? The following day went on more or less the same at first. We emptied the two full skips at a local waste management facility, then dropped them back in front of the property and resumed work. The hoard slowly depleted. To save skip space, we left an array of metal and electronics in the front yard next to the pavement for a scrap dealer to scavenge up. We'd taken such items to the recycling plant ourselves up until recently. Then the money paid for iron and copper had dipped and we were no longer considering it worth our time and effort. As we combed through the items in the bedroom, I started to catch photographic glimpses of what I presumed to be the former occupant of the house. A round-faced, blue-eyed individual with curly hair showed up in the photos during his early childhood, through his teenage years into adulthood. Aside from some wide fluctuations in his body weight, nothing in the photo suggested anything amiss with his life. He stood and smiled with his parents, cousins, grandparents and classmates. There was no evidence of him ever having a romantic partner, moving out, going to university or having a job. I checked the back of a childhood photo that showed the boy seated in front of an elaborate birthday cake in the instant before he attempted to blow out the candle. Terence. Sixth birthday was written in Byra on the bottom left corner. I reluctantly threw it into the skip with the rest. Finally, the house had been emptied. The walls were bare and the floor uncovered. The lives that had transpired between those walls had been exercised, and the space transformed into a cold, austere set of rooms. Paint peeled from the mold-ridden walls, and the discoloured carpets were frayed to within an inch of their life in spots. The place would need to be thoroughly cleansed and extensively renovated before anyone else could live in it. I was checking my phone in the kitchen when Henry called me from the garden. I went out to find him surveying a large, white chest freezer that lay on its side amongst the thicket. It looked like the one Melinda and I kept in our utility room, and used to store about a year's worth of meat, ready meals, and ice cream. Oh, I need to get this out, Henry said, tapping the lid with his foot. I just tested it. Oh, it weighs an absolute ton. Well, let's see if we can empty it, I said. Hopefully there's nothing biohazardous inside it. I won't get my hopes up, though. Oh, we need to flip it over. Can't open it like this. Okay. Then as soon as this is in the skip... We can knock it on the head. We both crouched with our shoulders braced against the freezer and pushed. Rolled over silently, forcing the amassed greenery out of the way and exploding a patch of bare soil. Ah, ready for one last surprise from old Terry? I said, pulling my gloves back on. This was the moment upon which everything pivoted. As I replay my actions through recollection... I can't help but unleash a futile, internal scream. God, I would give anything, endure anything, to be able to reach out and halt myself as I moved to open that freezer. I brushed wood lice and snails from the edges of the freezer lid, then lifted it open. Part 2 The thing inside the freezer defied explanation took several long moments of staring to decide whether it could more accurately be described as a thing or stuff. First, it appeared to be one giant mass of purple, white, and blue fungoid matter that strained to grow out of the freezer and into the outside air. The round bulbs, thin stalks, and papery frills into which the fungal flesh had shaped itself oozed a black, viscous liquid 
and emitted a smell that was so unique in its foulness that my stomach convulsed as soon as it touched my nostrils. Holy God, Henry breathed. The thing in the freezer reached out at us, revealing that it had arms with which to reach, and that it was indeed a thing after all. Something that resembled a head and bore the lingering vestiges of what might once have been a face rose to follow the arms. An orifice bloomed open in the misshapen facial flesh and revealed a black tongue that sprouted dozens of small, dark globules. The thing let out a long, low moan that conveyed nothing to me except unimaginable pain. <sighs> what is it? Henry whimpered. What do we do? I didn't answer. I was mesmerized by the thing. I stared dumbfounded at it, even as the arms flailed ever closer to me as it fought to climb out of the freezer. Then one of the hands clamped onto my left forearm. I shrieked in terror and struck wildly at the face with my free hand. The fingers felt cold and disgustingly soft. Get it off, I screamed. Henry kicked the thing hard over and over again, but it stayed fastened to me. He gripped the lid and slammed it down with all his strength several times. The thing was soft and yielding like rotten fruit. Wherever we struck it, the multicolored flesh flattened with a disgusting squelch, and the black liquid spurted out in snot-like bursts. Henry picked up a rock from by his feet and slammed it into its face. The head collapsed in on itself beneath the blow, and the thing momentarily slipped back into the freezer and relaxed its grip on me. We both pulled the lid down and flung our body weights on top of it. One arm was caught in the lid. The mushy flesh parted and the hands dropped to the floor limply. It lay there, twitching and wriggling. God, keep it shut, I said. Henry stayed leaning on the freezer while I ran through the house to the front yard. I grabbed a TV and carried it back through and dropped it on top of the freezer. I did this twice more until I was sure there was enough weight in place to keep the lid shut and the thing confined. I got a bin liner and carefully wrapped up the severed hand. We stood there panting and soaked in sweat, our minds scoured empty by the strain of shock that comes only from encountering an unprecedented degradation in the order of nature. My arm was smeared with the dark fluid. It felt cold, and my skin tingled painfully beneath it. I pulled myself out of the shocked stupor that had settled over me and ran to the kitchen sink. I ran water over my arm until the fluid was gone. I then found a sparse selection of cleaning things in the cupboard beneath the sink took a bottle of bleach and emptied it over the skin, and then returned to the garden. What are we supposed to do now? Henry asked. Well, I want to burn it, I said. Well, shouldn't we call someone? Whose job would this be? Uh, health and safety executive, maybe. Surely we should just call the council. They'll sort it all out. No, I want to burn this thing. It's wrong, and it's evil. Mate, I think it was a person. It must have some sort of infection. Well, I'm not even going to think about that. It's dangerous, whatever it is. I held up my left arm. Bruises smudged my skin where the fingers had gripped it. I'm going to burn it. If you don't want to help, then I won't force you to. I know something that shouldn't exist when I see it. Henry pondered for a moment and then sighed. Oh, how are we going to do this? he asked. I gestured at the foliage that surrounded the freezer. Right, let's cut this back. We carried a pair of shears and an electric saw in the truck, amongst other tools. We used these to partially clear a circle of ground around the freezer to prevent the flames from spreading. We then piled the garden waste on top of the freezer and the televisions that weighed down the lid. Then we stayed to guard it and add some wood and cardboard to the pyre while I drove to a petrol station and filled up a large water bottle with petrol. Once back, I poured it over everything. The tang of the petrol filled the air. 
The freezer remained silent, as if the occupant had returned to a state of dormancy once it had been sealed away again. Henry passed me his lighter, wordlessly deferring the final decision to me. Well, that was fair enough, since I had insisted so vehemently on this course of action. I flicked the lighter on and touched it to a stem of grass kindling. The fire blossomed amongst the stacked debris like wind-lashed flowers the colour of sunset. In a matter of seconds, it had encapsulated the entire pile. The bin bag that contained the hand was writhing and twitching on the ground. I picked it up and threw it into the blaze. Then Henry and I stood and watched dumbly as waves of heat radiated over us, our ears filled with a chorus of roars and crackles. I was standing close enough that it felt painful on the skin of my face, but I failed to muster the initiative to move. I felt disconnected from my body and drained of all energy and motivation to do anything besides watch the flames. After a couple of hours, the fire began to die down. We shook off the lethargy that had gripped us and fed the fire with wooden panels and cardboard for another hour. The sky dimmed in tandem with the flames. The fire shrunk to a few glowing embers, then to nothing. Then all that remained was the blackened, melted husk of the chest freeze. The hideous fungal being had been incinerated to the point of melding with its prison. Henry and I locked up the house and got back into the truck. Hey, um, let's take tomorrow off, I said. (sighs) Okay, Henry replied. I drove off. The skips, which still needed emptying, were forgotten. The reek of burned plastic and metal clogged our nostrils. Henry's face was pallid, his eyes downcast. I drove him back to his home in silence. Oh, nice of you to drop by, Melinda said as I entered our house. Your phone stopped working or something. No, sorry, I mumbled. Just got carried away at work. Hey, what's the matter? Melinda could always tell if I hadn't had a good day. Nothing, just saw some bad stuff today. Well, that had happened before. I didn't feel the need to go into detail, nor did Melinda insist on it. So, uh, how was your work? I asked. The same old, different day. I had a client hit me in the face by accident while we were having a seizure. Can you tell? (laughs) Near my left eyebrow. No, you look fine. God, I've phoned you about twenty times. I was hoping you'd pick up some milk on the way home. Oh, sorry, have you eaten? No, I was waiting on you. God, I'm bloody starving. Hey, um, should we order takeaway? Yeah, but can you, um, get in the shower now? (laughs) You absolutely stink. I love you, but you're disgusting at the moment. (sighs) Okay. Shall I get you an aspirin and a drink for when you get out? You look like you do when you've got one of your migraines coming on. Yeah, please. Shall I order the usual from the Chinese? Yeah, sure. I couldn't stomach much food. I pushed it around my plate and nibbled it occasionally, while Melinda talked about her day, about what her friends had been up to, about how we might be able to afford a holiday this year. Well, I nodded and murmured as and when required. Hearing her talk about going on holiday nudged me back towards reality and other worldly concerns. Images of the fungal creature had been imposing themselves on my thoughts, along with the occasional flash of the young, happy face from the photograph of Terence's sixth birthday. Now my mind was pulled, like metal to a magnet, to thoughts and worries about money. It occurred to me that for the sake of my reputation as a punctual, conscientious contractor, I couldn't afford to cancel the work that was lined up for the following day. That being the case, I really needed to empty the two full skips that we left in front of the house. I'd have to pick them up and get them emptied first thing in the morning. A day off was an absurd idea. I talked to Henry in the morning. If he didn't feel up for work, then I'd do it alone. All the while, I could only hope and pray that no one reported the fire, illegal as it had no doubt been. We'd been lucky not to have the police and fire brigade called on us while it had been in progress. These were the thoughts tumbling over each other in my head while Melinda and I went to bed. She set her alarm to 5am, as she had an early shift, 
and dropped off to sleep almost instantly. I lay awake, cradling my bruised forearm. It started to throb with pain. The skin felt hot to the touch. I phased in and out of consciousness, shivering and sweating intermittently. I tumbled like a wind-borne flake of ash into an endless, pulsating murk. The meaning of time disintegrated, leaving me stranded upon a sea of interminable black, a tortuous limbo between wakefulness and true oblivion. Part 3 Melinda was gone when I woke up. Sunlight crept in from behind the curtains. Something felt wrong as soon as I was awake enough to feel anything. I cast the sweat-drenched covers off of me, then screamed in terror and disgust. I frantically tugged open the bedroom curtains and looked at what had become of my left arm. Below the elbow, my limb was swollen to almost twice its normal size and warped itself into a shape only vaguely recognisable. Bloated fingers were almost impossible to distinguish. Lumps and tendrils had erupted from the skin. The whole thing was a swirling blend of blues, greens, and purples, dotted with white. It felt like a dead weight pulling down on my shoulder, a cold, porous lump of alien material. I hyperventilated, then vomited onto my feet, then hyperventilated some more. After that, there was no hesitation. I had to amputate my arm, then cauterize it. No other idea presented itself to me. I concluded, without a second of consideration, this was not a problem to bring to a normal hospital, nor one that would safely wait for the time it would take to reach one. I staggered out to the garden shed and fished out my electric hedge trimmer. Then I turned on the hob in the kitchen to its maximum temperature and placed a saucepan on top of it. I plugged the hedge trimmer into an extension cord so that I could use it in the bathroom. I knelt with my elbow resting on the edge of the bath switched on the trimmer. My heart spasmed at the harsh whine it emitted. Without allowing myself any time to lose courage, I brought the whirring blades down on my elbow joint, just above where the infection appeared to have advanced. My shriek drowned out the sound of the trimmer immediately. Blood exploded out over the bathroom in a crimson mist. My right hand began to tremble, then betrayed me entirely and allowed the trimmer to drop into the bath. I collapsed onto the bathroom floor. The infected portion of my left arm hung by a few strands of discoloured fibre. I struggled back to my feet and wielded the trimmer once again, severing my left forearm entirely. The sudden blissful swill of relief and subsequent crushing weakness almost caused me to allow myself to die of exsanguination. My entire body was soaked in blood, and more continued to pump out of the mangled remains of my left elbow joint. Weak and lightheaded, I shambled into the kitchen and used the last of my strength and willpower to press the bleeding stump onto the heated saucepan. The blistering agony that resulted was enough to pull me from the briefest of moments out of the trance-like, near-death languor I'd entered. Again I screamed, this time accompanied by the crackle and hiss of my veins and arteries being sealed shut by the heated metal. Blood bubbled on the surface of the pan, and the odour of burned skin overtook the coppery tang of blood. I held up the stump to inspect the result. My eyes drooped, my vision blurred, and I swayed on my feet. As far as I could tell, blood no longer gushed from it, which seemed enough to suggest that I had a chance of surviving. This was the best that I could do for myself at the time. I passed out the very next instant. I heard it as soon as I regained consciousness. A scratching, scrambling sound from the bathroom. It might have been what woke me up. In my delirium, I tried to use my severed arm to push myself back to my feet. I cried out in pain and sprawled onto the floor once again. I clambered gingerly and awkwardly to my feet and equipped myself with the largest knife I could find. I was too weak to grip the handle without trembling. I doubted I could have wielded it to any great effect, but I crept towards the bathroom anyway, 
retracing the trail of blood I'd left on the floor. A severed limb moved in the bathtub. It had sprouted several spindly black stalks that flapped and clawed like the legs of a stranded spider. The display was so grotesque that I couldn't help but stand and observe in sick fascination. For several minutes, the thing flopped around ineffectually in the bathtub. Then it gained purchase on the side of the bath and managed to scuttle out onto the blood-soaked floor. Another stalk extended from the part of the central body that had once been my hand. A dripping wet sphere of pale, veined matter hung on the end of it. It wasn't until it swooped around and fixed on me that it resembled an eye. In a sudden rush of panic, I pulled the hedge trimmer out from where it had lain discarded and slammed the door shut. I slumped against the wall beside the door and slid to the floor. The occupant of the bathroom was thrashing against the door, seemingly intent on escape. I tried to decide what to do next, but my mind had gone as weak as my body. Call the police? Maybe. Or maybe that would be a disaster. What would police do when confronted with whatever this was? Infect themselves and make the problem worse? Well, I had no wish to be responsible for that. The fire seemed to have destroyed it at Terence's house. I'd use fire again here, as soon as I had sufficiently planned such an operation. I managed to stand up again. My stump radiated pain. It seemed to throb with every beat of my heart. I got some painkillers and took them with water, then wrapped a tea towel around the stump. As I sat in my kitchen, my head in my hand, trying to organize my thoughts, my phone rang in the bedroom. It was Melinda. Hello, I said. What's up? Just checking on you. You seem to be under the weather last night. You need any medicine picking up or anything? No, no, I don't think so. Is everything else okay? If it's not, then we can talk whenever you need. You know that, right? Of course, yeah. Um, look, listen, something's happened. What is it? I don't know. I got infected with something, I think. It happened at work. We found something in this guy's house. Something wrong. I don't know what it was. It used to be a person, probably. Maybe. I don't know. I've had to cut my arm off. What? What are you talking about? Well, have you been drinking again? You promised you were going to stay off it for good. You know what happens when you drink. No, no. no. Really cut my arm off. You're not making any sense. Look, I'm, I'm coming home. I really wish you hadn't done this. She hung up before I could object. Shortly, the front door banged open. Melinda strode in, still wearing her work uniform. She looked angry and impassioned for the couple of seconds it took for her to reach the kitchen and see what I'd done to myself. Then her face drained of colour and she screamed. Oh God, we've got to get an ambulance, she cried. What's the matter with you? What have you done? I told you, it was the infection. What's that noise? Is there someone else in here? She moved towards the hallway where the bathroom was. No, no, don't touch it, stay out, I shouted, leaping up from my chair. She stood and looked at me in helpless confusion and worry. That's how I remember her now. It was a look she'd worn before, directed, as now, towards me. In the hallway, the bathroom door opened with a crack followed by a bang. The thing must have thrashed against the door handle long enough and hard enough to break it. Melinda stood directly in its path. She never stood a chance. Moved like blackened lightning, tearing through the house on its segmented, filament-like legs. Melinda had barely turned towards the noise when it was upon her. A short, strangled scream of surprise was all she had time for growled up her body and wrapped its legs around her head and torso. She tumbled to the floor, her arms and legs flailing. The thing's legs, suddenly flowing and jointless, wrapped around her neck and arms like snakes. She contracted until a series of sharp snaps signaled the breaking of Melinda's elbow joints and neck. 
Then four more of the limbs inserted themselves into her ears, nose, and mouth, sliding in impossibly far. Blood flowed in rivulets from each of those orifices to mingle with the profusely leaking black liquid, and her eyes rolled upwards until they were pure white. The thing's body pressed against the back of her head and shoulders and began to fuse with her. Despite her broken spine, her back arched and she emitted a hoarse, gurgling groan. I have no recollection of what I did as I watched this happen. Probably just stared, mute and useless. It was all too fast to even begin to interfere with. I don't think I reacted at all until a distorted, misshapen version of Melinda stood up started to advance towards me. It moved slowly and uncertainly, as if getting used to the unfamiliar bipedal form. It brandished the two broken arms at me like a giant, deformed mantis. The eye on the end of its stalk orbited Melinda's head, his gaze fixed on me. I turned and fled the house. I ran blindly for a while. I wore only the pyjama trousers in which I'd gone to bed, copious dry blood from the amputation. I passed by several people. No one attempted to stop me or to talk. I probably looked too deranged to help. Well, I wouldn't have helped me either. I made my way, without conscious decision, to Henry's house. There was no answer at the door. I went to the window, already knowing what I would see. The whole family were gathered in the living room. Henry, his wife Jill, and their two young children, Connor and Kerry. I could only just make out their individual bodies and faces from the huge, shifting mass of amorphous fungoid matter into which they'd been enveloped. It writhed and pulsated before me. The ceiling light was still on to illuminate the entire vile scene. I could even make out a family photo that hung on the wall directly behind the hideous explosion of mingled human and inhuman selves that the family had become. The formerly humanoid hand reached out towards the window, heralding movement of the greater mass in pursuit of another host. So, I fled once again. A few minutes ago, my suspicion was confirmed. I checked with my phone's camera. A small patch of dark purple has sprung up near the corner of my left eye, and another one next to my nose. I feel some more on the back of my neck. I've made a record of what happened. I don't feel I owe anyone anything more. I certainly won't be around to find out who, if anyone, gets a hold of this record. I'm back at Terence's house now. I brought plenty of flammable stuff in from the skips and piled it up in the top bedroom. Fire is the only reliable way out. Well, I haven't done a really good body horror story in quite a while, and that has all the classic elements in it, doesn't it? Yep, no way out. You're infected, no escape from you, no future. What do you do? Burn everything down. Sounds good to me. No, oh, a lot of fun, that one. Another 40-minute story, so, um, yep, I'm on my summer holidays from the day job, so going to be some longer stories coming up. A couple of series I've been trying to finish for quite a while now are going to happen very soon, I promise. <laughs> I've said that before, I know. But this time, yeah, got a you know, le much less busy few weeks coming up, so definitely going to be doing some longer stories. A couple of, um guest appearances on other channels as well so I'll let you know about those I'm getting back to doing some more collaborations haven't done enough at all in the last couple of years so getting back to that as well anyway I'm waffling on now well my dear friends till the next time possibly tomorrow night very very sweet dreams and bye bye thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, 
Hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.